Meanwhile, Athens Mayor Steve Patterson and Damon Crane go head to head in the Athens mayoral race. And two school districts in Athens County are trying to pass vital levies. A number of, of things about that building that ultimately we really can't fix no matter how much money we throw at it. Plus, we take a look at how issue one and issue two could change Ohioans' lives statewide. Ballot Watch starts right now. Welcome to Ballot Watch, our special election preview with content all about tomorrow's general election. I'm Silver Barker. And I'm Reese Thompson. We're giving you the rundown on how these election results will change the way Ohio operates locally and statewide. Here in Athens, residents are deciding who will be the next mayor of the city. Newswatch reporter Jack Green joins us live in studio with a look at the two candidates. Thanks guys. Damon Crane is again running to unseat Athens Mayor Steve Patterson. The two ran against each other back in 2019. This year, Athens Mayor Steve Patterson says he has one mission, keeping Athens great and making it a great place to live, work, play, and learn. Steve Patterson has been mayor of Athens since 2015 and says he wants to continue working on key issues such as affordable housing. We're losing faculty, we're losing staff, we're losing people who want to live here because we don't have enough housing stock. Patterson says he also wants to improve the quality of rental housing by hiring more code enforcement officers. He plans on doing this by raising reinspection fees for landlords. We know that we need to increase the number of rental inspection officers for the city of Athens in order to accomplish the um, inspections of the rental units. Um, so that's our plan moving forward. Also with changes to housing, Patterson says he wants landlords to go green as one way to reduce other living costs for renters. At the end of the day, who's paying the utility bill? The renter's paying it. And so if we can get better HVAC systems in those rental units, better windows in those units, better insulation in those units, better appliances, that is going to put much less burden on the renter in terms of their utility bill. Patterson also wants to continue rebuilding existing infrastructure. We've seen more infrastructure improvements since I've taken office. Since 2016, we've been able to receive over six million, closer to $7 million in federal and state funding for infrastructure improvements. Ultimately, Patterson believes as mayor, it's his role to meet people where they are and lead for all people. Last time, Patterson and Crane ran against each other. Crane lost by 1,500 votes. But a lot has changed in four years, and Crane hopes to capitalize on negative views towards the current administration. One of Crane's main issues is housing. He wants to not only better enforce city code, but tighten it by increasing fines and inspection rates. He says the lack of enforcement comes at the expense of Athens renters. We should be fining landlords on the spot to get these situations corrected much faster for the sake of tenant safety, and that would generate more revenue that would also fund a more vigilant code enforcement office. Crane also believes the city is overspending on policing. I think we can certainly afford to shift some of the money we're spending on policing and move it to other things to improve the lives of community members. Another key issue of Crane's campaign is getting Ohio University students involved in city government. 86% of our community is totally alienated from the public life of our community. Right now, the portion of our community that is actually included in public life is minuscule. Um, so, you know, if we want to talk about bringing people together, we've got to get past that. That's my priority. Crane hopes his priority to get OU students out to vote will drive turnout for other key issues on the ballot. You don't give people a reason to go to the polls when they don't have at least two candidates to choose from, then you don't keep them in the habit of voting. Whoever wins the race will be mayor of Athens until 2027. Reporting for Newswatch, I'm Jack Green, live in studio. Thanks, Jack. Coming up after the break, we take a look at local school levies and what the money will mean for the school if it passes. And to find the latest election results from races across Southeast Ohio tomorrow, you can find up-to-date information online at WOUB.org. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter, too. For a full recap of tonight's episode, subscribe to our YouTube page.
time on Antiques Roadshow, we're chugging our way back to Chattanooga for a new hour of Vintage Roadshow. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. When my sister sees this, she's going to wish she had gotten the doll instead. <laughs> the details are fantastic, and it makes me thirsty. <laughs> Can you guess which values went up, down, or stayed the same? Find out next time on Antiques Roadshow, Vintage Chattanooga, Hour 2. Tonight at 8 on WOUB. You are kidding me! On Finding Your Roots, Billy Crudup. These are the forces that shape our lives, you know? Yeah. And Tamara Mowry. You know when you always say, I got it from my mama? A patriot helped settle a city. How could this not have been passed down? And an ancestor challenges the establishment. He was a religious radical. That's insane! Plus, a DNA match. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. Tuesday at 8 on WOUB. Our spies' adventures aren't over. This latest mission sheds light on an undersea world built on relationships. There is teamwork, companionship, and communication. Perhaps we have more in common with these sea creatures than we think. Wednesday at 8 on WOUB. On Secrets of the Dead, hieroglyphics, mysterious symbols from the ancient past. For the ancient Egyptians, the word was incredibly powerful. But who inscribed the texts that help us understand ancient Egypt? These hieroglyphs, who painted them, I've got to get to know him. Decoding hieroglyphics on Secrets of the Dead. Wednesday at 10 on WOUB. Welcome back to Ballot Watch. For residents here in Athens, one issue you can expect to see on the ballot is a bond levy from the Athens City School District to build a new high school. Leaking ceilings, broken floors, and outdated material. These are the current conditions of the Athens High School, a school that the Athens Board of Education wants to demolish and rebuild. There's a number of, of things about that building that ultimately we really can't fix no matter how much money we throw at it. The school board projects the estimated cost to build the new high school to be about $58 million. In order to pay for it, the school board is asking voters to approve a $24 million bond issue on November's ballot, leading to a 2.06 mills increase in property taxes for Athens residents. For example, a home valued at $200,000 would have to pay $144 every year starting in 2025 for 30 years. Once the money is collected and a majority is spent, the state is going to pay $28.5 million. However, some Athens residents in the community are upset. Stop. No more levies. No going out to the community for more money. Just, just, just stop. Superintendent Tom Gibbs says this is a position the school board did not expect themselves to be in. In 2018, the initial plan of the Athens School Board was to improve all of their facilities through a $60.5 million levy approved by voters. While a majority of the money collected was spent on the rehabilitation of the elementaries and middle school, the school board planned to combine the remaining amount with pending state money to build the new high school. COVID hit spring 2020. Uh, that's when we were hoping to get a state approval around that time. Uh, the state put on hold many state projects, including prisons, schools. Uh, they actually kind of froze the capital budget for a, for a period of time. They currently have $6 million left from the levy approved in 2018, an amount that some would argue is more than enough to fix the current high school. $6 million is a lot of money, and they've got a lot of deferred maintenance. This is a really important point. Uh, and I think what they did was they deferred a lot of this maintenance to justify, well, we ought to get rid of this building because it's old and, and going forward. But Gibbs says with the rise of inflation in recent years, $6 million isn't a sufficient amount. If it, if it costs $58 million to build a new building that size, $6 million to renovate an existing building isn't, isn't going to get very far into all of, the, uh, all of the things that need to be accomplished. Other residents agree it is time for a new building as they worry for the sustainability of the current one. If you look at what we would expect from a modern building, that's not what we're getting right now. We have many issues in that building that are inherent to the design. So it's not maintenance, 
It's the fact that it was designed to do something else. The new building will consist of new amenities, including an auxiliary gym. It would be built in the two-level parking lot located next to the new high school. If passed, construction would start in 2025. A decision left in the hands of the community. Now, if voters approve of the levy, Superintendent Thomas Gibbs says the estimated time of this project could range from anywhere between 18 to 30 months. Just like Athens, the Alexander Local School District is hoping to pass a levy tomorrow. Newswatch reporter Parker Kapronica joins us for what needs to happen in order for the levy to pass. Thanks, Silver. The Alexander Local School District is looking to renew a 1% levy that only taxes earned income and provides roughly 11% of the district's budget. If not renewed, the levy is scheduled to expire in 2025, and given the difficulty the district has had passing the levy, it took six tries over three years. It's trying to get it passed sooner than later. Since it passed in 2019, the district has been able to grow its preschool, expand staff, cut athletic fees, and introduce a free breakfast program. While Alexander spends less than the state average per student, they still received a 4.5 rating on Ohio's school report card. Board member Dr. William Ramsey believes the performance warrants support. It's a good investment, it's a lot of bang for the buck, and uh, if we start to see a, uh, a reduction in that support, it's going to be difficult to uh, give those same opportunities to our students. It's going to be difficult to support our staff at the levels we are now. If the levy does not pass, the school will have to decide on cutting programs like free breakfast, making changes to the transportation system, increasing the student-to-teacher ratio, Superintendent Will Hampton fears a return to the basics. What's at stake really is us going back to bare minimums. If we don't have the resources to offer these extras and these enhancements, we'll have to go back to minimums. In a survey sent out by the district, the community seems divided. With 150 responses, 39% of people are for, 41% are against, and 20% are undecided. Prospective board member Stephen Crook believes the levy needs to pass, but acknowledges a disconnect between district and community. The students need it, the teachers need it, uh, all the staff needs it, um, and our community needs it. People don't feel like they are getting enough information in the full story on where the funds are being spent. Levy Committee Chair Jordan Hill says the disconnect comes from misinformation. If you're saying the district has irresponsible spending, well, if you check out our fact page, I have a lot of, we have a lot of facts where it proves otherwise. I just hope people are open-minded enough to look at those things and not make their assumptions based on what they hear out in the neighborhood or maybe on Facebook, because there is a ton of disinformation out there that's just not fair to the district and to the kids. Ramsey says passing the levy boils down to the support of students. When we were kids, um, somewhere, somewhere, somebody gave us an opportunity, somebody believed in us, and uh, I, I, I do expect that the community will rally around and do the same thing for these kids. If the district is unable to pass the levy, they will have two more attempts to renew it. Live in studio, I'm Parker Kapronica, and now back to the desk. Thanks, Parker. The Nelsonville-York City Council race is underway, and Haley Hollinger is live at Nelsonville City Hall with the latest. Haley. Thanks, Silver. Big changes are underway for Nelsonville City Government, between a new city manager and a new assortment of faces on council. But big changes are something the city is used to. A revolving door is the best way to describe the Nelsonville City Council over the past 10 months. After the resignation of former city manager Scott Frank, Justin Booth and Corey Taylor were the first council members to resign. Booth and Taylor's resignations were the first of many, as members popped on and off council by resigning and later rescinding their resignations. Now there are six seats open on council. The one seat not open will continue to be filled by Greg Clement. Tony, the six running are Tony Dunphy, Justin Booth, Doug Childs, Dan Sherman, Nancy Sonic, and Rita Wynn. The candidates have also chosen to campaign as two groups. One with Dunphy, Booth, and Childs, and the other with Sherman, Sonic, and Wynn. To most, this may seem unusual, but the groups reflect the different competing interests on the council. But at the forum hosted by the League of Women's Voters, the candidates in attendance agreed on every issue. City Manager Tom Kanjemi says he is looking for a council that puts the citizens' interests first. So, like any community, people are looking for good homes, good place to work, and a great school system. You know, and we want to have all those three at the same time. That is extremely important. That's what they want. The public will be voting for the candidates that they feel will be able to adhere to community interests like the ones Kanjemi mentioned when they vote tomorrow. 
Reporting for News Watch, I'm Haley Hollinger in Nelsonville. Thanks, Haley. Still ahead, we'll tell you about issue one and issue two and how these two statewide votes could impact our communities. For a more in-depth look at all the stories tonight, including interviews with the reporters, you can check out our news podcast, The Outlet. You can find it on SoundCloud, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts right now. I was calling to ask for some advice about having a word with Rose, about addressing needs, desires. I can't go back to how it was before. It was a moment of madness. It was the sanest thing I've ever done. You have tried to do what is best for your friend, but now you must trust me. Stay away from my wife. Are you threatening me? Are you planning to cut Ainsworth out of this deal? What do you prefer? We got other ways we can take over the hotel. Sunday at 8 on WOUV. On Masterpiece Mystery. The cabin that Morgan's arranged for you is very nice. Cabin singular. You won't say why he left no way. You don't have to turn everything into an investigation. Annika? I found a body in the river. You might need to come over. The damage had already been done. Detective? I need to know what's going on. Annika on Masterpiece Mystery. Sunday at 10 on WOUV. Hamas unleashed a ferocious attack. As the conflict intensifies, Israel continues to respond. A special presentation of Frontline's 2002 film, Shattered Dreams of Peace. How the historic peace process was undone. They really thought that Arafat meant peace. I didn't think that he meant peace. There are some points which, if you are in my place, you will not accept it. We are talking about the toughest issues that humankind has ever dealt with. Tuesday at 10 on WOUB. This title, Chaplain. Getting your work out on? Yes, sir. We'll get down there with you. People come to us with the things that normally burden their soul. Remember, you were trying to become the first female, uh, female Muslim, Muslim chaplain. chaplain. It's imperative to have somebody to say, yeah, I see where you're coming from. It's in my DNA to help you. Tonight at 10 on WOUB. With early voting underway and election day tomorrow, Ohioans take to the ballot box to decide whether or not to enshrine the right to an abortion in the state's constitution. Newswatch reporter Madeline Hardin is in studio with a look at what voters can expect from the results. Thanks, Reese. Ohio is the only state with abortion rights on the November ballot, and it's up to Ohio voters to decide if a simple majority will pass issue one to include abortion rights in the state's constitution. As the amendment reads, a vote for yes supports the amending of the Constitution to protect the right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions. This includes decisions on fertility treatment, birth control, and abortion. But it would also allow the state to restrict abortion after fetal viability, except when necessary to protect the pregnant patient's life. A vote for no rejects the measure. Voters can expect challenges from all sides after Election Day. Right now, while legal challenges to a law that banned abortion after six weeks went into effect with the overturning of Roe, people can get an abortion up until 22 weeks into the pregnancy. But if issue one fails, the period in which someone could get an abortion will depend on the outcome of the legal challenge before the Ohio Supreme Court. Protect Women Ohio, an opponent group of issue one, campaigns against the measure's wide scope. Because if issue one passes, it is essentially game over in Ohio. We will have the most extreme abortion regime in the entire country cemented in our constitution, and there is nothing we can do about that. Protect Women Ohio says that the passage of issue one will close the door on the debate about when someone can get an abortion in Ohio. The organization has rallied against issue one to protect parental rights along with health and safety precautions. An OU health policy expert, however, sees a different outlook for the state. What? most Ohioans can look forward to if issue one passes is an end to the uncertainty uh, that we've seen for months and years now. Even if issue one passes, experts say this doesn't mean the fight for abortion is over. If issue one passes, it will be the beginning of a new politics in Ohio as well. Ohio Right to Life and other groups will surely regroup 
and try to devise other um, strategies for um, limiting access to abortion in Ohio. And issue one as written doesn't completely close the door. Regardless of the outcome on election day, the fight over the issue will continue. Michigan's Prop 3 passed last year to amend its state's constitution. And since, anti-abortion groups mobilized against bills to repeal dormant anti-abortion laws still on the books. If passed, Ohio would join states like California, Michigan, and Vermont in cementing the right to an abortion in its constitution. I'm Madeline Harden, reporting live in studio. Thanks, Madeline. Community members are voting on a controversial topic that is turning legal state by state. Issue 2 pushes to make recreational marijuana regulated like alcohol. But how are local businesses preparing for the change? Let's take a look. Retail dispensaries, growers, and cultivators of recreational marijuana could become a reality for Ohio. If issue two passes, it can provide economic opportunities, but those looking to cash in will face a lot of unknowns. It's a new industry. It's not like opening up a new car dealership or, or a new regular C CVS drugstore where you have a template and model to fo follow. We are creating the model. Silver Serpent General Manager Alex Schwartz says if issue two passes, selling recreational marijuana will be more complicated for small businesses beyond just obtaining a license. There's so many parts of the business that are in this legal gray area where we have to educate and walk customers through not incriminating themselves or not incriminating ourselves that uh, navigating risk is a fundamental part of being a local smoke shop. Getting a dispensary license costs $80,000 every two years. Schwartz says the cost may not be worth selling recreational cannabis. That's something we're looking at right now, but the likeliness of it is probably pretty low. The cost is, it's a lot, like to even have an opportunity to get a dispensary license. For medical marijuana businesses like Harvest on Union Street, who already have a license, our hopeful recreational inventory will expand their consumer base. As of 2022, the Marijuana Policy Project reports only 1.49% of the Ohio population own a medical card. I think when um, recreation will change that, drastically change that, and um, because people don't like the government all up in their business. You know, they don't want to know. I don't need you to know. When I go get some Tylenol, don't nobody know I'm buying Tylenol, so why do they need to know <laughs> if I'm buying cannabis? 50 new dispensary licenses and 40 new cultivator licenses would be available if recreational marijuana becomes a reality in the state. City Council Member Micah McCary suspects Issue 2 will likely pass and eventually, McCary says, could be an economic driver to attract visitors to the community. There might even be opportunities in the same way that Athens has a brew week. Uh, I imagine that there might at one point be some sort of uh, way to generate revenue through uh, programs and events that involve cannabis. Issue 2 would impose a 10% tax on any purchases, with those proceeds going towards administrative costs and addiction treatment in the state and two municipalities that host dispensaries. After the break, a look at what this general election means on a national scale, including a glance at Kentucky's governor's race. But first, here's a look at what's coming up tonight on your public television station. There is a battle playing out in the southeastern corner of Utah. It's a fight over whose voice gets heard, who decides how this region, now known as Bears Ears, is managed, protected, and preserved. These resources are too valuable, they're irreplaceable, and once they're gone, they're gone. Thursday at 10 on WOUV. The thing about Native women leaders, they have that toughness, that backbone. I will continue to fight for our most vulnerable people. There's always work to be done. I'm proud to say that I am a Native designer. I embrace that. As a woman, it's a part of my responsibility to take care of the environment. We owe her our life. Tuesday at 9 on WOUB.
I'm Billie Jean King. Women's sports changed the whole world. With your voice, you lead the way. The greatest mystery that Agatha Christie ever created was herself. What do you suppose it's like falling down a rabbit hole? We have much to be grateful for. You will find out so much about yourself just learning comedy. Moneyball, come on, how y'all doing? There's nothing there. It's a miracle. If they don't laugh at me in class, why would I think somebody else will laugh at me? I'm losing confidence in whether or not I'm funny. This is way harder than I thought it was going to be. Friday on WOUB. While we focus on our election here in Ohio, important races are happening across the country, which could have huge implications for next year's election. Let's take a closer look at a few races you should be aware of. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir and candidate Daniel Cameron are making their final appearances to pull in votes for the gubernatorial election. Like Ohio, Governor Bashir and Cameron are debating on abortion rights. Around 83% of Bashir's supporters oppose the state's no ex exception abortion laws, which he agrees with. According to the Emerson College polling, the two are in a dead heat with 47% supporting Bashir and 47% supporting Cameron. That being said, support for Cameron among older voters has increased since the October poll. Bashir is making his final stops in his campaign tour today, while Daniel Cameron plans to make his final remarks tonight with former President Donald Trump. Like Kentucky and Ohio, Virginia's election heavily surrounds abortion debates. Both chambers are up for grabs with the Republicans being a majority in the state house and Democrats running the state Senate. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin has a chance to place a ban on abortions after 15 weeks if the House Republicans gain full control of their state government. The ban would allow exceptions for rape, incest and when a mother's life is in danger. As we look towards the 2024 presidential election, Pre President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are gearing up for a rematch. New polling from this New York Times and Siena College shows Biden falling behind Trump in five of the six battleground states that helped him win the election in 2020. The current president is trailing Trump in Nevada, Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and only ahead in Wisconsin. Biden is also losing support with two key voting demographics, excuse me, black and Hispanic voters, but Trump's ongoing criminal cases may be a major factor, though. The poll found roughly 6% of voters across the battleground states would switch from Trump to Biden if Trump is convicted. That's a big enough switch to ensure Biden's re-election. There's still time to vote in the general election tomorrow. You can go vote in person from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. A few of the polling locations have changed, but you can find updated locations by visiting boe.ohio.gov and looking for your county's Board of Elections. And that does it for our broadcast this evening. Thanks for watching. For all the Newswatch reporters who joined us for the special coverage, I'm Reese Thompson. And I'm Silver Barker. Stay tuned for the PBS NewsHour coming up next. For more in-depth election stories, check out the outlet wherever you listen to your podcast. And tomorrow, we'll be providing up-to-date coverage of the election all night long. You'll be able to find it at WUB.org or follow us on social media. Have a great night. This is the PBS app, ready for you when you want to watch full episodes of your favorite shows. Even stream your local station 